However, deep learning models are vulnerable to adversarial attacks. An adversarial attack applies carefully crafted perturbations on data inputs and fools a model into making incorrect predictions. Adversarial attacks jeopardize many deep learning based technologies, especially in security and safety critical applications, such as data driven healthcare and self driving cars. Due to the threats of the adversarial attacks, people cannot confidently use deep learning models. To overcome the vulnerability of deep learning models, we need to understand how the adversarial attacks permeate the model's internals. Also, for a better understanding about adversarial attacks, it would be worthwhile to examine if and how an attack's strength changes how the model produces incorrect predictions. For example, it would be useful to know if a stronger attack exploits the same neurons as a weaker attack does, or if those sets are completely different. We present Bluff, an interactive visualization tool for discovering and interpreting how adversarial attacks mislead DNN into making incorrect predictions. Our main idea is to visualize activation pathways within a DNN traversed by the signals of input data. For given input data, an activation pathways consists of neurons that are highly activated and the most influential paths. Activation pathways represent what features are detected and how those features are related to contribute to the final prediction. To understand how the attacks manipulate the neurons and the paths inside the models, Bluff visualizes the activation pathways of both benign inputs and attacked inputs. That is, Bluff finds and visualizes the most activated pathways given benign and attacked input data. Bluff also visualizes the most inhibited paths by the attack to uncover where the attack is blocking the signals to the benign path. Also, Bluff visualizes the most excited paths by the attack to uncover where the attack stimulate to induce the activation pathways going towards wrong directions. The Bluff interface tightly integrates three coordinate views. It consists of control sidebar, graph summary view, and detail view. Here, a user inspects why a deep learning model must classify adversarial giant beta images crafted by the projected gradient descent attack as armadillo. In the main graph summary view, we visualize the activation pathways of benign and attacked input data. Here, each vertex represents a neuron. When hovering over a neuron, Bluff shows the detailed information of the neuron. The detailed view for a neuron shows a feature visualization and example data that visualize what feature the neuron is detecting. For example, for giant panda images, this neuron looks for face of animals that have white furs and dark eyes. Feature visualization is a synthesized image that maximizes the corresponding neuron's activation. Dataset examples are patches of images from the training data that highly activate the corresponding neurons. We also show how the neuron's median activation will change according to different attack strengths. Here in the graph summary view, the neurons are represented with different colors based on their roles. The green nodes are the most important neurons only for the original class, giant panda, which means they are highly activated by benign giant panda images. The blue nodes are important neurons only for the target class, armadillo. The orange nodes are the most important neurons for both original and target classes, giant panda and armadillo. The red nodes are the neurons that are highly activated by only successfully attacked images. These neurons are exploited by the attack to induce the incorrect prediction. By exploring the activation pathways, PGD successfully perturbed pixels to induce the brown bird features, an appearance more likely shared by an armadillo than a panna. Both armadillo and brown birds have small, roundish, and brown bodies. The brown bird neuron then contributes to the armadillo misclassification.
Hello, everyone. I'm Wilson Good at the Ski Institute here at the University of Utah. Today, we have the honor of going over a spotlight session of the challenges we face visualizing the bioelectric fields in the cardiac and neural domains. We will have three speakers today, uh, three amazing speakers who will talk about the, the visualizations they've used in their research. Uh, we will have a small Q&A session in between each of the speakers and a long panel discussion between all of the speakers at the end of the spotlight session for the last 30 minutes. The speakers you will hear from today are mostly trained as biomedical engineers and as a function of their research have had to use visualization in order to better interrogate their data. We want to hear from you, the visualization community, uh, about the visualizations we face visualiz visualizing these bioelectric fields. Um, and we, we really encourage you to ask questions throughout on Discord, and we will try to address those in the intermediate Q&As and a Q&A at the end of the session. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, we will start with our first speaker today, Rob McLeod from the Ski Institute, uh, who will be introducing the spotlight and going over some of the challenges we face in the visualization of bioelectric fields in the cardiac domain. Thank you so much for listening, and this, this should be a great spotlight session. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. No, that's not a fake backdrop. It's not a visual impersonation. That's the real thing. We're standing here on the Colorado River in southern Utah outside of Moab. And I'm happy to welcome you to Utah, to our visualization conference and to our spotlight session on visualization and bioelectricity of the heart and of the brain. I'm incredibly sorry that you can't all be here in person. We were all really looking forward to this meeting, to having you all here, especially on my friends, Jason and the team from the IEEE Viz VeloViz Club. Um, I'm really sorry we won't get our do a chance to do a ride together here in Utah. Um, it's a spectacular place with many riding opportunities and we don't get to do it this year, I'm afraid. But we'll make up for it, hopefully in the future. And we'll always welcome you here to Go for rides and enjoy our state. The talk I'm about to give will get into a little more of the scientific side of what we do here. We don't spend all our time out here enjoying beautiful scenery and great bike rides. We do find a little time for what I hope is some interesting research. And we certainly need visualization in that research. And I look forward to motivating some of you um, to help us with that as we try and grapple with some, some real problems, um, real challenges that get in the way of our our fundamental research, get in the way of clinical practice, get in the way of how we can use the electricity from our bodies to add, diagnose, to devise therapies, and to guide interventions. And hopefully you'll find that interesting. So I'll be back shortly with a little more science. But in the meantime, let's enjoy a little more of that Colorado River and the beautiful red rocks of southern Utah as the sun comes up here in Moab. Bye for now. Welcome everyone. No longer Moab. We're back in Salt Lake City. Um, still a great place to ride a bike. And again, my regrets for not being able to show you some of my favorite spots. But we will share some science now and some visualization that will hopefully um, partially make up for the lack of outdoor amenities here. I want to open this spotlight that we've set up for challenges in the specific visualization of bioelectric fields, which are really fundamental aspect of research that has to do with the heart and with the brain and several other organs, but certainly the big drivers are heart and brain. You'll hear um, separate presentations about the brain, so I wanted to focus maybe a little more on the heart, but also provide a general overview of what motivates this type of visualization, how this visualization has really enabled so much of the science, uh, of the clinical practice, um, of the development of technologies and industry. So, so there's, a, there's a broad interest in visualization as a breakthrough element of the technology that um, hopefully I can, I can share with you. Before I start, I do want to mention and highlight the, the work that Wilson Good has, has done in setting this up. Bei Wang also played a key role, um, but Wilson was, was definitely pushing, organizing behind the scenes, getting all the pieces together. And I think we, we owe a lot of recognition to him for, for his work. He's um, going to be defending his PhD shortly. He is a, a bioelectric engineer, biomedical engineer and so knows the field very well. And he's also produced some spectacular visualizations, some of which I'll be able to share with you. 
So, so this really represents a, a, a great deal of what I've done in research for many, many years. And as it turns out, the last time I appeared before a Viz audience was in 1992. And you can see here the, the case study I provided. I was in a case study section back then. And Chris Johnson and I, together with Mike Matheson, were presenting some of our um, first results, really, of simulation, modeling, visualization in this area of cardiac bioelectricity. And we were a little younger then, as you see from this image here. Um, and I think we've, we've gone on to, to lots of great applications of visualization. And, um, and I think I've been you know, very fortunate to, to have started in, in such a great way with, with this group and, and, and with this team. And, and so some of those visualizations that we described back then in 1992, we're actually still using. One of the pieces of software that Mike Matheson helped me get started with has continued on uh, throughout the intervening years. It's been part of an ongoing NIH-funded uh, Center for Integrative Biomedical Computing, or CIBC, and is still available for free download today and is still um, a topic of ongoing improvements, bug fixes, the usual things. So, so I, I think we've uh, been able to show that a good visualization app openly available can fill a niche and continue to f does continue to fill a, a niche. And I think the key point about that software and a lot of the software that, that I'll tell you about and that we've produced is that it really is closely connected to the application domain. I think the biggest mistake one can make in computer science generally and certainly in, in the area of visualization is to assume that you can work independently or that a visualization specialist can work independently of the application experts. I think that's the path to a lot of wasted CPU cycles and time and energy and brain power, and that the best um, products come out of a close affiliation between the application scientists, the clinicians, whoever, and the, the computer scientists. And it's that merging, that marriage, that we've really uh, created the Ski Institute to address. And I think a lot of our success has come because of that close relationship between those two groups. And I'll hopefully convince you of, of how that works out. Fundamentally, we're trying to understand the electricity and the interaction of electricity with the body. And we'll see shortly that the body generates its own electricity. Um, fundamentally, it comes from what are called ions. Ions are what you get when you throw a salt in a solution. Uh, they form an electrolyte, and those ions are charged. And when you have movement of charged particles, you have current flow. When those charges separate, you get a voltage. Whenever you have gradients, you get transport. There are all kinds of fundamental biophysical mechanisms that are at the core of what it is that really drives uh, at the macro scale and the clinical scale even what it is we do. But it starts with ions, ultimately. And, but very quickly, we're going to move forward and, and upwards in scale and talk about muscle, for example. Um, muscles are mechanically active. They contract, of course, but they're also electrically active, and that's a, a valuable field of application for electricity as it affects the body and as it is generated by the body. But the focus today is going to be more on cardiac bioelectricity or cardiac electrophysiology. And what you see here is an image that tries to capture, in a very schematic way, um, the electrical energy, electrical sources, the signals literally, the voltages as a function of time, these are scalar signals, as they arise in different parts of the heart, and as they are integrated in a very complex way that we partially understand, um, to form the signal we can measure on the body's surface, the one you all know about called the electrocardiogram or the ECG. And, and most of what we do in terms of understanding the heart's signature, especially the heart in distress, the heart in disease, is understanding this relationship between the individual elements within the heart, within its tissues, and their signature on the body surface. We can, of course, do the same thing in the brain. The brain also generates electricity. It also generates a signal called an electroencephalogram, or EEG, and that signal also contains information. It's a time signal, just as the ECG is a time signal. Uh, the history is over a century old. Um, the first electrocardiograms were measured in the late 19th century and, and have been the product of ongoing development, of course, over the last hundred years. This image is, is a historic one from the seminal uh, research by a guy named um, Eindhoven. Um, Eindhoven was a, was a Dutch scientist, physician, engineer who won a Nobel Prize for his discoveries. 
Um, the, the electrodes he developed are the very simple electrodes that you might see when you have three wires connected to a body or maybe four. And, and they provide a very basic information about the heart's electrical activity. Of course, that uh, development of that, that, that sampling, spatial sampling, has increased over time to the point where we now have an electrode system that looks a little more like this one, where we have additional electrodes placed on the typically anterior surface of the body, mostly on the left side, sometimes augmented by electrodes on the right side. But as engineers and scientists, we all know that the more we sample, the more information we get. And so this is this general idea has led even to a commercial application um, uh, of a device that records 200 electrodes, places literally in the form of a vest that you see here, 200 electrodes on the body surface to really capture the full spatial extent of the temporal signals that we collect from, in this case, the ECG. And of course, where we have enough data, where we have enough sampling, it should be a natural step to imagine that we have imaging. And sure enough, we have imaging modalities that are called. And, and these imaging modalities seek to use mathematics, use physics, to quantitatively relate the signals as they come from the heart or the brain and the signals recorded on the body surface, either the thorax or the scalp again. So here we see sort of schematically um, the, the mathematics, if you will, uh, of, of what goes on. On the left side, we have sources of bioelectricity. They may be tissue level sources or organ level sources. There's a whole field developed to characterize these sources. And then we have a volume conductor, it's called, in this case, the thorax you see here. And, and then we have recordings that we make on the body surface. And if we go from left to right, we have a mathematical forward problem. We know the source, we know the medium, we predict the body surface potentials. The clinically more interesting one and more challenging problem is to drive it the other way, from right to left, to acquire information from the surface of the body and then predict or reveal the underlying electrical activity in the heart. So, so we can now picture this whole domain schematically as broken down into a simple two by two matrix. And, and that has to do with the organ involved. Obviously heart and brain is what we're gonna focus on in this particular session. But we have diagnostic approaches, and then we also have what I'm calling modulation approaches. And bear with me while I explain that. So on the diagnostic side there, it should be already clear. The goal here is to record information on the body surface and from that determine electrical activity in the heart or in the brain. Modulation is a different process. Modulation is introducing electricity into the body in order to change the behavior of the organ that sees or responds to or, reach or receives that electricity. So that's modulation. In the extreme, you can think of defibrillation. You've all heard of that. There are implantable defibrillators like the one pictured here. There are external defibrillators. We see them on the walls of public buildings. They have a importance in, 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 in the extreme case of a heart that stops beating. The same applies in the brain. We can have situations where we sample on the scalp or on the face, as this case. These blue dots are all meant to be electrodes that truly are available commercially to purchase. We can take that information Again, localized activity in the brain. This is more of the diagnostic domain, but we can also modulate the brain's activity. And this is a very big domain. You're going to hear lots about in the lectures later on. And because we have measurements on surfaces and we either measure or calculate or estimate um, the same or equivalent values inside of tissues, we end up with a very complex set of data domains. And that's something, of course, every computer scientist or visualization expert understands very well and that we have we have information, usually scalar values, but scalar values that change in time on, let's say, the surface. These could be on the surface of the brain and the surface of the heart, but we have surface-based data. We have lots of volume-based data, like this, where you see the electric potential, the voltage inside the thorax as the result of a defibrillation shock. So we have lots of volumetric potentials. And then we even have tensor quantities, like what you see here in this small animation. These arrows all represent the directions of local fibers, they're called. They're the tissue elements that make up the heart, make up the, the especially the, the two lower chambers of the heart. And they have different orientations, and we have to visualize those. We can acquire this information. We can estimate and predict this information. It's a key part of the, the models that we, that we actually generate. So 
we have at least these three types of data to deal with that I want to talk a little more about. And just to make things more complicated, we also have the need to integrate time into our visualizations and time across different scales. So the, the heartbeat happens once per second. The, the frequency ranges of bioelectric signals go up into the hundreds of, of hertz. So there's a, there's a moderately high frequency of signals that we have to capture and, in, and, and then convey in, in our visualizations. And here you see a, an example from that old program I mentioned at the beginning, this one called MAP3D. And here's a surface rendering. You see the time aspect of it in the upper right corner is a single time signal from a location on that electrode array that surrounds the heart. Integrated in with that is a photograph. We needed to know where do these electrodes sit relative to that heart and that heart relative to the rest of the thorax in this preparation. And so, so we need to gather all that information together and, 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 and really convey it in a, in a meaningful and rich way. And that's a specific challenge we have to deal with. And then on top of those two challenges, we have integration. So here's another example. This is integration and interaction. So we have integration of imaging data, of, of um, catheter information. You see a line there that's the catheter. You see in background there's some green there. That's information that was extracted from these MRI images in a pre-processing stage. So this is not even electricity yet, although those electrodes sample the electricity. And we, we, we usually have to mix that into our, into our displays. And we have to be able to move it around in time and look at it from different sides. It's a very complex picture, even for an expert, to identify what the anatomical elements are and what the behavior is. We have a moving heart on top of that, a contracting, beating heart. This all has to happen in some controlled way with different views and lots of interaction. So this interaction with the data is a key element. Almost all useful medical visualizations, in my experience, have an element of interaction. It's not enough to see a fixed image. It's not enough to see a, even a pre-made video. To be truly rich and truly useful in the clinical setting especially, this has to be an interactive process. The operator has to be able to move the visualization around, determine what's visible, what's not visible, how the mapping from value to color occurs, all these elements of, of visualization. So, so that's, in a, in a nutshell, the big challenges that we're facing. And I want, hopefully it can motivate you to think a little more about how you might be able to help us solve some of these challenging problems. And in the meantime, I'll show you some viz. I'll show you some history of viz, some of the things that people have used over the years, some of the things we've developed, the elements of our visualization, the examples of how we've solved partially at least some of these problems. So viz has a long history in bioelectricity. 1970, here's a, a wonderful rendering, obviously here not interactive, no time it directly implied in this image, but a very artistic rendering of a heart, of course. And the heart's been opened in order to reveal some of the volumetric potentials as well as some of the surface potentials. So it's a, an integrated hybrid type of visualization generated through some interpolation. All the tricks have been used to, to acquire this information, which came from human hearts. These are from explanted human hearts in which multi-electrode needles were inserted to capture the three-dimensional distribution of electricity in that particular heart. And the contours and colors here represent the time sequence, the activation, uh, where the activation begins, where the electricity starts in the heart, and how the electricity spreads throughout the heart which of course is the precursor to the contraction that follows later. So again, this goes back a long, long time. It's heavily edited and heavily um, schematic almost in its smoothness. But, but it's, this is one of the key observations actually that came out of this period in, in, in science from the Dutch group in Amsterdam led by Dirk Dürer. And this is a hallmark paper in our field in part because of the visualization. But there are even older examples than that that I want to share with you. And these are examples produced by a former colleague of mine. Uh, one of the reasons I came to Utah 30 years ago. His name was Bruno Taccardi, and he was an Italian scientist, a physician scientist, who explored the electrical activity in the heart and always wanted to use state-of-the-art visualization to capture that. In fact, he was the motivation for lots of features in MAP3D. Because of our collaboration together and our working with the data closely, we added a lot of features or had them added to, to really support that science, um, which arguably is what makes that program useful, at least for that type of science. 
So we see here, for example, a, a short animation from a movie that they produced in 1964 in his group in Milan at the time. And here you see a one-dimensional visualization showing how activation spreads, how act excitation moves down this, this bundle, this fiber. That's a simple one-dimensional story, but already nicely rendered here in black and white and with all its, its imperfections, but remarkably rich, actually, in information. The second visualization shows a similar story playing out in the tissue, at the tissue level. So we see activation or excitation starting at one corner of this block of tissue. The lines in the tissue represent the boundaries of individual cells in the heart, and we see excitation traveling through that tissue. The final sequence integrates it all together. So here we see a cross-section through a thorax. The lighter color is the cross-section of the ventricles of the heart. The visualization here is of electrical current flow. So it's a vector visualization, if you will, showing through those moving white dots how the current flows through the torso, originating from a heartbeat from one instant in time. So this whole picture is evolving through time, and at every instant in time, every couple of milliseconds, there'd be a different pattern of those currents, which are also flowing in, in, in very short time. And so this is this captures already the, the challenge that, that we have in visualization, but also some of the inventive solutions that, that Bruno Taccardi and his colleagues came up with so many years ago. So now I want to move forward with some, what I'm calling random examples of visualizations that we've carried out to show you some of the, the key features that we really do find essential. And, and, and one of the essential aspects, this time aspect, has led us to produce animations like this. Ideally, they would be controlled animations that one could interact with and one could re rotate this volume around. This is a heart, of course, you recognize it by now, maybe. And, and what we're seeing there is this spread of activation, the thing you just saw schematically in that black and white video, done in a more modern way. Uh, the underlying data came from simulation, but it's a very realistic rendering of at least one pattern. So, so here's another rendering that came out of our own research group. This is Kadar Ras's research work. And Kadar was a, was a graduate student of mine. He's now a faculty member um, at, at uh, George Washington University. And here we see renderings of volume, surface, anatomy, and time all together. So, so these are complex renderings. They at least allow us in a single image, which is something we can publish, to capture a lot of the behavior of interest for us. Now to produce these images, we need interactive tools. We had to set up this visualization by being able to pan through space, move through time, and create the right sort of setup that we could then capture and say, okay, for my message, for my conclusions from this science, Here's an image that gathers it all together. On the left, you see the anatomical image with some volume rendering um, or something like it that shows you the, the two chambers, the left and right ventricle displayed here. Um, the middle bank of, of images are slices. In fact, the left side, you see three horizontal lines. Those characterize the slices that you see in the middle. And in those slices, we embed values of voltage color-coded. And those voltages tell us something doesn't really matter what exactly at this point, although I'd love to tell you more about it. And on the right-hand side, we see the associated voltages again rendered on the surface of the entire heart. So this allows us to see some volume, some surface, and then we see it evolve over time as we go from the top row to the bottom row. So, so this is time on a slow time scale. This is time during, in this case, an intervention that's meant to replicate a heart attack. So this is a heart undergoing a heart attack. And we're following it through time, and we're following it through space, and trying to capture key elements of its behavior. And these are the kind of, of compromises, if you will, but games we play to try and capture the data in a meaningful way for us. But these depend to scan the data to, to identify the key features and key moments and key spaces on interactive tools that allow us to integrate different types of data, visualize them interactively, and then wander through those data sets. I can't overemphasize how important it is to handle large data flexibly, large numbers of cases, large numbers of, uh, or, or a single heart in large numbers of circumstances over time, slow time course, fast time course, and then explore, and then play until we get that picture that captures our message. Here's a more modern example. This was rendered by Wilson Good, who I mentioned before. And here you see, again, a slice through the left ventricle in this case. 
So the left ventricle is, is sort of a ring, and we're seeing its, its, its contour like, like a, a small U-shape there. And so the anatomy is the same in each case. But what's, what's different here, again, is what exactly we're rendering. So we have different types of data on the same anatomy. Some of them measured directly, some of them derived from measurements, some of them created through simulations, and we have to integrate those all and look at their interactions. It's their interactions that tell the story for us in this case. So here we have on the left this thing called activation time that tells us the sequence of activation or excitation or electricity as it goes through that particular slice. And then from that, we've derived a conduction velocity of course, if you have a wave moving, you have a velocity and you even have a direction. The direction is captured in the wave refraction column. That's another index we've extracted. And then finally, we can extract parameters, voltage-based parameters that we're calling ST40 potentials. These are electric potentials that tell us about the underlying state of the heart. And we can capture those in that same situation. Now, we chose to use different color maps for each one of these. Some of them are conventions, some other ones we just uh, identified as useful. They revealed the details of interest for us. And then as in the rendering before, we move through time as we go from the top to the bottom. So this again is an intervention. You see the time values there from zero to eight minutes. This is following the progression, again, of a heart attack as reflected in all these different parameters. And that's another example of this integration, exploratory, interactive visualization that we need to really tell our stories. And then finally, when we get a story that we think we can tell, we sometimes have to bring it back to anatomy. So here you see a very complex and almost abstract looking rendering, which is actually in gray, the ventricles, the blood chambers of the, the ventricles themselves. And then in, in this color rendering, again, an image of the conduction velocity, color coded with arrows to give us directionality. This is very challenging. We're not very good at this yet. This is a place we'd love some assistance. It's dealing with these complex multifaceted data sets that are different data types, different types of data from a, from a physiological perspective that we somehow have to see in an anatomical context over time. This is our challenge. Here's another small you know, rendering, a, a visualization of that same sort of data. And there you see some changes going on. Again, as we move through this heart attack, you see some small direction changes. You see color coding here as a, as, as a way to render conduction speed. And these are the kind of complex data sets that we're dealing with. Here's another example, also by Wilson Good, where we try and combine data, again, from different types and then extract from that statistics that we can use to evaluate, in this case, different ways of rendering those conduction velocities. So here's a direct comparison of different ways, and you recognize streamlines as a technique completely out of the visualization domain that we've made use of here to try and interpolate and render and estimate the conduction velocity as they come from the measurements we make on these hearts using electricity, using bioelectricity. So in summary, we have major needs that we still would love to have addressed and we'd love your help to, to, to make this possible for us. We have diverse data that comes from all sorts of different sources, surface, volume, tensor quantity data. I haven't even shown you many examples of that. We have time to deal with, so we have to capture time, both high scale or rapid time and then slower time scales. We have to integrate data from multiple sources and we have to be able to interact with it. Now I'll also show you, in fact, a couple of clinical examples that really capture what the potential is. These are from devices, from systems that are available commercially, used every day in every major Western cardiology or electrophysiology lab within a cardiology group. And, and they capture the behavior of electricity in the heart using these catheters that we described before, these electrodes we introduce into the heart. And they, again, provide anatomical information. They provide instantaneous voltage information. From that, they derive amplitude information. From that, they derive the activation time information, the sequence of the beat that they're characterizing. And that's used not just to diagnose the patients, it's actually used to perform therapy in the patients. It's used to guide the placement of catheters that will actually intervene and change the structure of the underlying tissue. So they're combining those two topics I said were separate before, diagnostics and modulation. In this case, they're modulating the behavior of the heart by, in some cases, literally burning defective parts of the heart tissue. And these systems 
ultimately depend on visualization. They only work and they only came into being when the visualization was able to catch up to the capture and measurement aspects of these devices. So visualize, this is a visualization success story, I would argue, and, and it really has shown the potential. Now, at this point in using these devices, it requires a separate operator to handle all the manipulations and rendering and control of that visualization. It's not possible for the physician to do the job that they are there to do at the same time as they control that visualization. So it requires a lot of close partnership between two people. That's another challenge that I think would be a great one to address, is how do we tighten that loop? How do we find new ways for physicians to interact with their visualizations and guide it directly rather than through some sort of code that eventually evolves between two specialists who work closely together. Um, so there's lots of room to continue to improve these systems, and there's certainly lots of measurement improvement, each of which opens the door and the potential for new visualization opportunities. So, so visualization is alive and well and respected and acknowledged as a very practical tool within the fields of bioelectricity in the heart and in the brain. And you'll hear shortly a lot more about applications in the brain. So with that, I, of course, I want to thank the many people who've participated in, in this research. I want to highlight again Wilson Good, who helped so much in putting this whole session together and provided some of the visualizations you saw, and the rest of the team, the grad students current and past, who've, who've, who've all made visualizations using the tools that our developer team at the Ski Institute within our CIBC, our Center for Integrative Biomedical Computing, have, have developed and made available to us and to the community. These are open source tools. And we encourage others to explore them and even to extend them, uh, again, being open source tools. And then finally, of course, the Ski Institute is a wonderful home for this research. Uh, Chris and I have been incredibly fortunate to see the group grow as it has over these many years since that 1992. Uh, first appearance of this conference. I'm so thrilled to be back again. I'm so sorry we can't be interacting in person, but it's great to hopefully hear from you and to be able to share with you a little of the research that um, we really have, have found to be driven by visualization and, and, and show you how much visualization plays a role in the physiology and clinical projects that we encounter. And Thanks so again, and I hope you enjoy the rest of this special session. Bye-bye. All right, thank you, Rob. That was a great talk. <clears throat> uh, we have some uh, people in the Discord who are very interested in some of the visualization examples from uh, the 20th century. Uh, the, we, we know those are, have been very impactful visualizations for our field. Um, I, I, you know, I'm, uh, the modalities and techniques for visualization have advanced a great deal over the last number of years. Uh, how, in your experience, have these developments in visualizations you know, facilitated understanding, developed understanding uh, of the underlying data. Yeah, the, the, the developments, both of the hardware and the software, you know, basic elements, tools we have to work with is, has been transformative. Um, when I came to Utah, we had our first uh, 3D real-time rendering workstations available to us. And so I could suddenly um, start to implement ideas and visualization that I'd only really dreamed of before when I was connecting through a, you know, a, a 2D color terminal over a 19,000 baud link or something primitive like that. So, so there's been this, this I think, natural um, push-pull relationship between the capabilities as they, they develop, the software tools as they develop, the graphics libraries, and, and then the, the, the aspects of the data that we're able to see. So, so there were, we, you know, working with somebody like Bruno, who had such a long and successful career and was a really visionary person, was instrumental um, in showing me just, just how technology continues to 
bring the field forward. And, and visualization is one aspect of that, of course, one, one very important aspect. And, and so, so we've seen this, this constant, you know, growth and things we're able to see, the depth we're able to explore things, the amount of data that we're able to manipulate and, and interact with is, has increased dramatically over the past decades, you know, that I've been involved in the field and, and, and uh, which is not to say we don't have problems still to solve. And that's, I guess, what hopefully motivates some of the viewers today. Yes, exactly. And uh, please, everyone ask questions you want us to address. Uh, we have one from Discord here. Um, uh, so a lot of the results you publish are outside of the visualization community. Uh, can you talk and perhaps uh, address uh, publishing in visualization venues versus more of these domain specific venues? Yeah, obviously, the, the message has to be different. And, and there's um, situations where I, I guess I feel like we have made contributions that are fundamental to visualization that are that have a novelty in that setting. Um, but a great deal more of what we do and how we see ourselves in the Ski Institute generally is as this bridge between the kind of papers that come out in a computer science setting or a visualization domain specifically, and then the application of those into different domains of, of in our case, you know, biology, electrophysiology of the heart and the brain. And, and, and so I, I, I think, you know, we all play a wonderfully synergistic role um, that hopefully drives things forward. The demands are clearly different. I, I, um, I can publish, you know, hopefully insightful ideas about how the heart works in one setting that would not have much impact in the visualization world. And, and, and yet the, the impacts of the visualization technologies that we publish in, in those journals hopefully have a, a much broader impact even than than what we can picture and so so we we want to see these tools um, make it into lots of different areas and 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 that has happened over the years um, i've had some you know some wonderful interactions with domain scientists in other areas than my own who found map 3d and said i could i think i could use that for my data but i need some help to render it differently or to Use a different color mapping, or, or, or you know, some other feature of it, and so we've. It's been very enjoyable to work with those domain scientists to adapt the software to their needs, and I and I think that's a key element that hopefully you know brings some joy and satisfaction to the visualization scientist to 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 work with a domain scientist, adapt the the technique to that particular application, and and. Um, I, I've certainly derived fun from that. There have been some interesting papers that have come out over the years uh, in that space between the technology and the science. Yeah, there's clearly a, a synergistic role between you know the visualization community and the domain scientists. Even going back to those early uh, <clears throat> those early examples, it's clear that these visualizations were sort of uh, essential for understanding these complex uh, interactions. So even in these early era. Uh, type examples, it's clear that visualization facilitates this sort of understanding. Um, okay, uh, so we'll, we'll save the rest of the questions for the panel session, uh, but please uh, continue asking those and we'll uh, get the entire panel to uh, answer. Um, so let's move on to our second talk uh, today by Andrew Jansen from Vanderbilt University, uh, and he will walk through us. Uh, he will walk us through the examples he's used in uh, visualizing bioelectric fields and deep brain stimulation. Thank you so much, and remember to ask questions as you have them. Thank you. Hi, I'm Andrew Jansen from Vanderbilt University Medical Center, and I'm going to talk to you today about guiding deep brain stimulation research with bioelectric field visualizations. Although our brains are well protected by bone and fluid, they are still quite susceptible to being compromised. The individual neurons in the circuits that make up this complex organ can easily be disrupted through structural damage, genetic disorders, or infection. And damage or malfunction to individual components, this interconnected system can affect wide scale brain dynamics. The most common neurological disorders amongst adults with approximately 1.2 million cases each year are stroke, Alzheimer's disease, epilepsy, Parkinson's disease, and traumatic brain injury. The functional impact for each of these disorders is wide ranging, affecting motor function, attention, memory, and your levels of consciousness. And with no known cure, these disorders typically require lifelong management of symptoms. Interventions and treatment of neurological disorders range from preventative measures, such as lifestyle changes, to rehabilitation and medication. 
and surgical operations, which are the focus of my research, are typically thought of as a last resort. One type of surgical intervention that has emerged over the last few decades as a treatment for several of these neurological disorders is deep brain stimulation, or DBS. DBS is a medical device-based therapy in which small wires or leads with several electrodes are implanted into specific regions of the brain and connected to a pulse generator. The pulse generator can be programmed to deliver electrical pulses at different amplitudes and frequencies to tune how the stimulation modulates the surrounding neuronal tissue. The programming of the DBS devices is performed by trained clinicians and is individually adjusted for each patient. It is challenging to determine the stimulation parameters that will best alleviate the patient's symptoms because the choice of which electrodes to turn on, what amplitude, and what frequency are nearly infinite. Clinicians rely on experience, intuition, and trial and error to program each device, which is made even more difficult because they may not know exactly where the leads were placed and exactly how each stimulation parameter choice is affecting the surrounding neuronal tissue. The success of DBS for Parkinson's disease and a central tremor has prompted the investigation of this therapy for several other disorders that have limited treatment options. The challenge in establishing new DBS therapies is the identification of a target, the ability to accurately implant the lead at that target, and determining which effective stimulation parameters to, are to provide therapeutic benefit on a patient-specific basis. The focus of my research is on the use of bioelectric field simulations to guide decisions about implantation location and therapeutic stimulation settings. And we do this by creating virtual uh, 3D patient-specific models that integrate the patient's own anatomy and segmentations of anatomical nuclei, along with reconstructed white matter pathways in the brain, and with the simulation and visualization of the voltage distribution generated by certain configuration settings from the DBS lead itself. And we use all of this together to predict the response to a given lead position and configuration setting to how the white matter pathways or anatomical nuclei will respond to stimulation. And one of our first steps to integrate this into surgical decision-making and planning workflows was to create near real-time biophysical simulations of this. The idea was to make this near real-time so that way surgeons could use this alongside their normal planning procedures and we could provide almost immediate feedback about what their current plan and thought process and stimulation settings would be to on the neuronal tissue. And we can map fiber voltages, we can visualize ISO surface potentials, and then we can visualize uh, predictions of activating values or how the, these neurons will activate in response to the varying amplitudes and locations. And what we quickly found was that while this was very useful, one use case we didn't have in mind was collecting multiple of these simulations together and being able to visualize and compare differences in electro positionings or different configuration types. And the limiting factor here was how do we display all of this together? Essentially, a surgeon would go through and test several different positionings, but then we needed to give them feedback about their entire plan and how each of those plans may differ on activating these neuronal elements. And so the question really became, how do we visualize data across multiple simulations, and by extension, also multiple subjects? Because perhaps they had a position that worked in a previous subject, and they'd like to essentially recreate that in a new subject. And how can we map data across subjects together to make more informed uh, global decisions about how the DBS therapy is working. And so for a single case, we, we have several options. Uh, we can start providing, we can start collecting essentially those, those data elements and those simulations one by one, and we can start mapping them. So here we can show for every single contact that you might turn on given a certain position, we can sweep across all the voltage amplitudes that are reasonable and make predictions about how the percentage of fiber bundle activation as a function of voltage across all these contacts. And then we can start mixing and matching uh, combinations of contacts to create unique configurations to see if those can do a better job at activating these neuronal elements. And we can do that for the left and the right side, but we can also then start doing this and plotting it for each lead trajectory that is tested. And so the other example is how can we integrate 
data across subjects. And so I'm going to give you an example of a non-human primate stimulation study we performed where several monkeys were implanted uh, with deep brain stimulation leads uh, in the central thalamus to test their behavioral performance changes and identify a unique clinical target uh, for traumatic brain injury uh, clinical trials. Our objective was to identify the common neuronal elements being activated across all, all subjects and all stimulation configuration settings. On the left, you can see all the implanted leads across all the entire uh, non-human primate cohort, which are quite variable, even though we were trying to target the exact same structure in all cases. And across all of our experiments, we identified stimulation locations and configurations that were either having a positive effect or increasing cognitive performance on tests, had no effect even though we were providing the same levels of stimulation, and those that, if they were stimulating in the wrong area, induced a negative effect or decreased cognitive performance on a test. And so what we wanted to keep track of was what we called uh, the configuration's influence on activation, which we summarized or summated each configuration's ability to activate every single fiber line inside of the fiber bundles. And so we could keep track of how many configurations were activating each component of the fiber bundle itself uh, in each of these three cases. So if we look at the negative effect first, we can see uh, a fairly mixed activation between two of our suspected or, or hypothesized target fiber bundles in the area. But if we move to stimulation configurations that were producing no real effect, uh, we start seeing a core of higher levels of activation in one fiber bundle and a bit of a steering or a, an avoidance of fiber and bundles uh, over here. But then what was really striking was then when we looked at how each configuration that we grouped into the positive effect group was activating these fiber bundles, we saw major selective activation of one fiber bundle over the other, showing that nearly every single configuration that we tested in this positive effect group was activating every single fiber bundle in our hypothesized target. But what we lost was exactly what these configurations meant, or what was common amongst all of these configurations together. Uh, and that middle step kind of stops us or limits us from, from kind of guiding new lead placements. And what would be really useful here is to visualize the unique uh, vector fields generated by each stimulation configuration, and also visualizing the average or kind of the combined electric fields or vector fields and how they might differ and how they're both unique and similar to guide new placements of, of DBS leads in the future. And so with that, uh, to summarize, we use DBS simulations and visualizations to guide surgical placement. And we've done this now uh, in several human subjects as well as uh, non-human primate subjects. What we want to analyze or visualize are multiple simulations and subjects together to inform, to inform our clinical decision making. And what we really need of these, these visualizations is that sometimes they're going to occur on arbitrary, for lack of a better word, substrates or coordinate systems like these uh, fiber bundles rather than just spatial voxels. But we still need to keep some anatomical positioning and understanding of the bioelectric field uh, solutions in mind to kind of guide our future placement of our DBS leads. And with that in mind, I'd like to thank both the Ski Institute and the Department of Biomedical Engineering at the University of Utah and my funding sources, which contributed to much of this research. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Andrew. That was a great talk. Um, in terms of uh, uh, in terms of patients, uh, how has visualization improved how we manage patient care, uh, at least in the contemporary sense? Yeah, so from two sides, I think the visualizations overall have been giving clinicians more confidence 
in their decisions about uh, how to fine tune uh, parameter settings while they titrate these patients over months after surgery. But also in my specific cases, when we've started applying this, these types of visualizations, this therapy to new disorders and new targets where even the neurosurgeons who are usually experienced with hundreds of, of implants for Parkinson's disease and other, and a central tremor, uh, through kind of trial and error and just sheer numbers, they, they kind of have developed a really good intuition about how to place these leads and how to program them. But in these new targets, uh, I think we've, we've been able to provide them much more confidence, much more quickly about honing in on specific targets and specific therapeutic settings uh, in these patients, you know, on the order of, you know, a couple of patient implants and rather than, you know, taking a hundred or several hundred implants at a time to really fine tune these adjustments. And I think that confidence has really translated into just quicker uh, titration and solution of, of what works for these patients. Awesome. Thanks so much. Um, we have a question from Bay uh, asking, um, so you mentioned about uh, visualizing the average vector fields uh, across a cohort. What is the state of the art uh, in terms of visualizing these sort of um, atlas-based vector fields uh, in neural, neural research? Yeah, so that's a great question, Bay, because that's essentially a question I would ask you or other visualization experts at this point in time. And this was something I was trying to play with, but couldn't quite get there for like the end of this project, which was we can kind of visualize individual vector fields, but I don't, I don't have a good answer for that. And that's kind of what I'm searching for is an answer of how to visualize both the individual vector fields, which is fine, but then how they kind of fit in the global average of what we've applied to all other, other, other patients. Awesome. Um, yeah, no, I, I have similar problems with uh, my research with vector fields in terms of how to parse complex vector fields and interpret them in a manageable way is something I also run into. Um, so so you, you got into with these visualization uh, issues and how they improve these patient care, uh, but how receptive have, you, have these clinicians been to use, using these uh, new visualization tools relative, rather than you know, using their intuition as they've been using in the past? Yeah, so that kind of goes hand in hand. And in some ways, uh, we've been lucky with a few uh, clinician scientists really who have you know, kind of allowed us to come in and, and aid them. And then we still had to convince them, but it really only took one, maybe two cases of going through these surgical planning procedures with them and providing them this feedback where they, they became very responsive, very fast. Uh, and we went, in, we went in with skepticism as well because we know there is so much uncertainty about these types of visualizations and how much they're gonna help. And so there's kind of a ranking, right? They still treat their intuition or other types of imaging metrics or electrophysiology metrics that they're recording. But I think we're slowly kind of climbing up that list of, of ranking in, in how impactful these types of models are in their decision-making process. But again, it's, all, it's always a, a scope. We're never taking just the, whatever the model says or we're not even just taking whatever the imaging or the electrophysiology says. And so it, it always is kind of a, a mash together of all of them in how they make these decisions, but we're, we're slowly climbing up that list to kind of be more impactful, more impactful. Awesome, that's really great to hear. Um, all right, so uh, we'll save the rest of the questions for our panel session. Uh, that was a great talk uh, by Andrew Jansen. Uh, we'll be moving on to our third and, and final speaker uh, for this spotlight, uh, Smitra Rampersad uh, from Northeastern University. Uh, and she'll be walking us through the challenges she's faced at, uh, in non-invasive brain stimulation. Uh, and, and she'll also give a couple of recommendations uh, of the challenges we are still facing in this field. Um, thank you, and please ask any and all questions you have on Discord. Hi, my name is Sumitra Rampersad and I will be talking about simulations of brain stimulation, primarily non-invasive brain stimulation, and the challenges we have in visualizing the results of those simulations. I'll first give an introduction into the field and the type of research that we do, and then describe some challenges we have in visualizing our results. I'll show the solutions we currently use and discuss how these can be improved and what is still missing. One example of non-invasive brain stimulation is transcranial current stimulation. This involves placing electrodes on the scalp from two 
to basically whatever you can fit on the head and sending weak currents through for moderate amounts of time. Uh, this has only minor side effects, mostly mild itching of the skin and some mild pain. And positive effects have been shown on uh, neural excitability, on intrinsic oscillations as measured with EEG, and on brain activity measured with functional MRI. And those effects have been shown in healthy volunteers, for example, on working memory, but also in a variety of patient populations. Um, such as rehabilitation after stroke, depression, anxiety, addiction, and many others. Uh, besides um, having various effects on brain activity and minor side effects, TCS is also cheap and easy to apply, making at-home treatment a possibility. However, effects are small, short-lived, and variable. We don't exactly know how it works, and it's difficult to target a specific brain region. It's even more difficult not to stimulate certain regions that you don't want to stimulate, especially when you're trying to reach a deep brain area. We try to solve these problems using modeling. Here's an overview of the entire process. We start with the equations that describe the physics of the problem. Here that is finding the distribution of electric potential throughout a head, resulting from current injection through the skin. To solve this requires a distribution of conductivity in space. Uh, so we build a finite element model by acquiring MRI images and segmenting them into different tissue types. From this segmentation, we construct a mesh of tetrahedron-shaped elements, describing the geometry of the head. Then we assign each element a directional conductivity that um, represents the tissue in that element. We add electrodes onto the model and then solve the equations for the potential. This results in a distribution of potential everywhere in the model. And from this potential distribution, we can calculate the electric field everywhere in the model, the current density, or any other um, parameter we might be interested in. Now, this is often the endpoint of a study. This information, electric field distribution in the brain, can be used, for example, to calculate the um, average field strength in a specific target region or to calculate the maximum field strength achieved anywhere in the brain for evaluation of safety. A second option is to combine the simulated field strengths from all, diff all, all kind of different configurations and use those to find the optimal configuration for a specific target region. Then we apply those in an experiment and we measure its effects on brain function. I've shown the process here for TCS, a technique I described in the two previous slides, but this pipeline shown here also applies to many other forms of stimulation. For starters, there are several forms of TCS, supplying either direct current, alternating random noise, or temporally interfering currents. This is an uh, example of a study currently ongoing in my lab, where we try to improve memory function in healthy elderly. Uh, we do that by trying to stimulate the mid-singular cortex, which is a region relatively deep in the brain. Uh, to reach this area, we use individual MRI-based head models, and we define the target region using functional MRI to find each subject their own optimized configuration. Then we apply these individual configurations in a placebo-controlled study, where we use cognitive tests before and after the stimulation to quantify the effects. Um, other forms of stimulation for which we use similar methods are transcranial electric stimulation, which is similar to TCS, but with stronger and shorter currents, and transcranial magnetic stimulation, which uses a coil against the scalp, and strong current pulses through that coil to induce action potentials in the underlying cortex. I also want to mention two invasive stimulation forms for which we use the same uh, modeling methods. There's electrocorticography, which uses electrode grids placed on the brain, and stereo EEG, which uses electrode leads placed in the brain. Now, surgeons use these methods in epilepsy patients to find where seizures originate. Uh, we are currently working on a project in collaboration with the University of Washington, for which we simulate and optimize stimulation patterns that they then apply in their patients. So these are some examples to give an idea of the field and the applications. Now let's look at how to visualize the data. 
So from the simulations, we have the field strength in each finite element of the model. Here's an image of the model's brain surface with the color of each element representing the local field strength. As I said, using these values, we can do some analysis like field strength in the target region or maximum field strength anywhere in the brain. In most cases though, we also want to see the distribution. See the size and the shape of the area at the target that gets stimulated. Um, see what happens farther away from the target. Because even with optimization, while we're guaranteed to hit the target, we are mostly always st also stimulating other areas with equal or even higher field strengths than the target. Now, if the target and the peak field strengths are on the surface, this image here tells us mostly what we want to know. But when the peaks are deeper, it's not very useful. So here's that same brain and field distribution. Now, when we look inside the brain, we see that there are peaks on the inside that we could not see from that previous image. So this is one of the difficulties in this field. There is an electric field everywhere in the brain with peaks at multiple locations and you want to see all of it, not just a small area around the target. So this is a solution I commonly use. I've now made the brain surface transparent and in order to see where the peaks are, all elements with a field strength under a certain limit have been removed. So now we see the brain shape and we see the peak distribution at the same time. However, from this figure alone, it's hard to grasp what you're looking at. Like, where are those fields? Are they on the surface? Are they deep inside? You really need to rotate this image to see what's going on. But um, in publications, we clearly cannot do that. So this is another difficulty of the field. We're always working with three-dimensional spatial distributions of a complex shape and often have to show these in a 2D image. Currently what I do to um, fix this is just show the image from different viewpoints. It definitely gives a better picture of what's going on, but still does not give all the information and requires some mental processing and some space. So what we need is a way to represent these 3D shapes clearly in a 2D image. Now the next problem is related to this. Here's the same image where I cut the model at a specific field value to show the areas receiving the highest field strength. Often what we would like to know most is what part of the brain tissue got modulated by the stimulation, received a high enough field strength to achieve an effect. Unfortunately we don't exactly know which field strength value in is needed to induce an effect in the brain. So while cutting part of the brain was helpful for visualization, it also removed information we do want. Additionally, if the volume above the threshold is large, there's also a lot of information inside that volume that we cannot see. Now an obvious solution to this problem would be to use isosurfaces, which we have tried, but when you visualize multiple enclosing surfaces with such complicated shapes, it just becomes a giant mess. So my current solution is to provide multiple images with different cutoff values, as you see here, but we still lose information because we have to pick discrete values or we would use a ton of space if we use many different values. But what we need is a way to show spatial changes of the electric field in a 3D volume, preferably continuously, without using pre-selected cutoff values. Now, to make things even more fun, we also have 4D information. Here you see again the electric field above a cutoff value, but now we start varying the input currents, which results in a movement of that peak electric field as a function of the input currents. So this works well in a presentation, but it's very hard to display in a single image. Here are some of the solutions that we've tried using two different software packages. Uh, in all of these images, for each step, each current value, we take the peak volume and give it a single color. Then we add all these fields together in one image. So now the color no longer represents the field strength, but the 
represents the current value that caused that peak volume. Now this does illustrate that the field roughly moves from the left to the right side of the brain, but the different peak volumes are overlapping, so we are still missing information and looking for a better way to visualize this kind of information. In the previous slides, we looked at volume above a certain field strength, but we are also interested in the actual field strength values throughout the brain as a function of these varying input currents. So again, for the information. Here's an image of how we solve that uh, using software called MuView. We take a 2D plane through the model, select a subset of locations in the brain, and then at each location we plot a tiny uh, figure in which the current ratio is the horizontal axis and field strength is represented by a vertical line. So disadvantages of this image um, are clearly that you have to downsample and you might even miss the most interesting parts and we only have a 2D plane. This software does allow you to do this in 3D but then we arrive at the same problem we've seen before that it is almost impossible to see uh, where in space each data point is, where it belongs, without rotating the view. Now in the previous examples we only talked about the strength of the field, but electric field also has a direction, which we are often interested in. So to visualize the field direction we tend to use glyphs, as shown here. Each arrow shows the local direction of the electric field. In this image also the arrows are colored by field strength, and this solution works very well on a plane, but again, it becomes quite messy if you try it in 3D. Another way to show direction is by using streamlines. Here's an image of field strength in the brain resulting from current injection through electrodes on the, on the brain. The streamlines connect the electric field vectors following a path starting from a selection of seed points so this provides a continuous path um, through the brain and it works well in 3D as opposed to the solution on the previous slide. However, the sample points are somewhat arbitrary. Um, so this figure kind of suggests that the current goes from one electrode to the other without current going anywhere else. While in reality, the electric field and the currents are everywhere and images like this lead to misconceptions by the experimental side of the non-invasive brain stimulation field. Um, so when the experimental community looks at modeling images, they might get the wrong impression, not knowing how did we put these images together and how do we select our seed points. Now we could solve this by using many more points, but clearly the image would become very hard to comprehend. So what would be helpful is a method to comprehensively show streamlines throughout the brain. I'd like to thank you for listening to my talk. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them now or you can connect via email. Did that video cut off? I think it's just true. All right, thank you so much, Sumitra. That was a great talk. Um, we have a question from uh, the Discord. Uh, we have some neuroscientists locally. Oh, sorry, this is this is from uh, Noska Smith. Um, sorry, uh, yeah, we have some neuroscientists locally working on electroconvulsive therapy to treat depression. Is this a similar uh, therapy to the to the interventions you showed here, or is this something completely different? Um, it's both similar and completely different. So the similarities with uh, from ECT and uh, TCS, the, the method I described at the beginning of the talk, uh, is that both apply electrodes to the scalp and send currents into the brain. So it, it really looks very similar. Um, big difference is that the currents with ECT are much, much higher. Um, so we're talking like 800 milliamps versus 2 milliamps in, in my case, what we use, and much briefer. So it's, it's more of giving a shock. And also the purpose of it is quite different. So in electroconvulsive uh, therapy, you try to basically induce a little seizure in the brain. And what we try to do with uh, current stimulation is so very low currents for a longer period of time 
to try to modulate um, the excitability of the neurons. So generally, like ECT is not really grouped with the time with um, the methods I described, which is why I didn't mention it, but it is in a sense very similar. All right. Um, I think it's, pr uh, yeah, so it's probably, there's a number of questions that we'll probably address as a panel. Uh, so let's, let's switch to that now. Uh, and um, yeah, let's, uh, let's uh, switch to the panel session. Um, so Wilson. Yes. Uh, I, I would like to ask the, all the panelists, uh, what is the role of uncertainty visualization in their current research for both uh, sort of in practice and in theory, right? I think this is one part that, you know, uh, occurred to me throughout, and I think it would be a great interest to the visualization community as well. Uh, so I kind of put the question there. Um, and another question I think uh, in general is sort of, what is the difference between, uh, I didn't put it there, but what is the difference between individual like sort of personalized visualization versus the visualization of a cohort. Um, I think this arise from Andrew and as, as well as uh, the last talk we just heard that there's always this question between uh, relation to ensemble visualization. So that would be an interesting thing to discuss as well. Uh, that is purely from a visualization perspective. I think those are the topic that would be interesting. So anyway, let's move to the panel. I, yeah, so I, th I think we should start with the, the uncertainty question is um, certainly a good a good place to start. I think we all sort of uh, addressed that. Um, let's see here. Let me uh, let me uh, I'm trying to find the question per uh, exactly here. Um, but yeah, no, uh, per perhaps can each speaker uh, comment on how uncertainty is used in potentially the visualizations they showed or in their field in general. Uh, Rob, uh, can you perhaps start and we'll, we can walk through the various speakers on yeah, that? Sure, I'd be happy to. That's, it, it, that's a, a very um, key element of medicine, of course. When a physician um, makes a clinical decision, either a diagnostic or a therapeutic decision, um, that confidence in the results and in the data they're using to make that decision is incredibly important. Um, for many years, we've had the luxury that we weren't really adding so much value to what a physician did. I mean, we were more chasing them around trying to understand um, how to interpret their data uh, using, using modeling, simulating, um, comparing it with experiments. But, but now in the past really five or 10 years, the, the field has advanced, the field of simulation and, and the visualization that goes with it has advanced to the point where, where physicians are incorporating the predictions we make into their diagnostics and, and even using some of these to guide their, um, their interventions. So that, that brief snippet of video I showed you with, uh, with catheters you know, moving inside a heart, um, that's a visualization that physicians are using right this minute in many hospitals around the world. And, and we don't really have useful ways to capture the, the uncertainty in the catheter location. We don't have good ways to capture the distortion that we know, for example, inevitably happens because we're taking an image that was recorded in an MRI machine. And the reality is that that patient has changed since that MRI scan. And then on top of that, this is a living, breathing human being that is uh, undergoing real-time therapy. And so, so the heart is beating, the heart is moving because of respiration. And these are all factors that fortunately, physicians are really good at incorporating into their, into their uh, I guess, decisions as to you know, where to intervene, where, where to apply that, uh, let's say, energy that they're going to use to, to hopefully um, bring about a cure. And so, so this is absolutely um, a, a major challenge in, in so many regards. And um, there's been certainly, I would say, some progress <clears throat> in trying to capture this, but, but it's, it's mostly, I think, again, in, in, in relying on this convergence between the visualization, the rendering we can do, and using the brain of the operator. Um, physicians are very good once they sort of see the pattern of motion, let's say from respiration, or they see the effect of a contracting heart, they're building that into their thinking. They're applying their own correction to the catheter location, um, you know, just based on their experience and their, and their you know, knowledge of, of often many years of, of doing procedures like this. But we don't support them. Um, maybe as well as, as as we'd like, as well as we might be able to, and and this this definitely um, provides a challenge. 
And I would say generally in, in the world of simulation, we're still searching for the right sort of tools to capture the extent of uncertainty. So there, there's, it's, there's one thing to get the data in the first place in the sense of how, how much confidence do we have in a prediction we make? And then, and then secondarily, and that definitely remains a challenge to, to visualize it in, in an effective way. Um, so, so yes, this is a very, very real world um, challenge that, that is important clinically today and, is, and will become more important as we see more and more simulation in, in our domains, um, you know, making it into the clinical world where, where the physicians will demand that we give them some level of the confidence that, that we can provide with our predictions. Uh, Andrew? Yeah, so I'll say to piggyback off of Rob, kind of the number one thing I'm seeing requested from clinicians is kind of a confidence level that we can provide to our, our simulations, our predictions. And in some ways we are making predictions. We're saying the patient will respond or the patient has this problem. Um, and if and it's okay, it's okay to be wrong as long as we have a, a low confidence level attached to that. That's kind of where we might then lose kind of the confidence of the clinicians in our modeling predictions if, if we're wrong. And that's been an important focus that we've, we've been trying to introduce. And right now we're typically right there alongside the clinician. So anytime they kind of start to over-interpret the data or kind of misinterpret the data where they're telling them and kind of reining them back and saying, no, this is, we're a little uncertain about this aspect, but they're starting to use these independently from us. They're gonna go off and start looking at these modeling results, not with us, you know, over the shoulder and telling them. And we definitely need clear cut visualizations or even just some type of metric to, to remind them like, this is where we might be a little more uncertain or no, we're really certain in this case, you can trust us a little bit more. And that, that has to match kind of our actual predictions. That, that, yeah, that's a, really, that's a really good point, Andrew. Uh, Sumitra? Um, so I have to say, uh, to kind of follow up on, on Rob and Andrew, the, the people doing non-invasive brain simulation have a bit of an easier life since um, the brain doesn't move, right? Well, it can shift a little bit, but um, we don't have the, the big problems that um, people studying the heart have. So that makes our lives a little easier. Where we do have uncertainty, mostly in our simulations, is in the conductivity values that are used to um, represent the tissues in the head. And basically the measurements that have been done are pretty poor and, and there's just not that much data and people just use whatever's out there. And so our, my field is a little bit younger in uh, relation to the other two. And really people haven't looked at uncertainty that much. It's just, right, it's still a developing field and people are happy to see simulations at all. Um, and I would say one big problem that we have a lot is that there's kind of two communities of brain simulation, a non-invasive brain simulation field, where there's on one side, there's the engineers doing the simulations and on the other side, there's um, neuroscientists and clinicians using the, the stuff we produce and, and using optimizations. And they, it's not that they don't talk, but they generally don't really get each other that much. So um, what I see a lot is that clinicians have way too much um, trust in what we produce, like they, they, they expect it to be very certain. Say, oh, if you, if you optimize, um, you know, the, one of the questions we, we would get a lot from that side is, okay, I want to stimulate this area in the brain. Can you optimize electrode placement for me? And then when you give them a, uh, a placement, they expect that now this person will be, you know, stimulated exactly there and it will be perfect. And it's just so far off. So um, yeah, we, we do need to talk, <laughs> communicate better, but I think, having good ways to visualize uncertainty would be a major um, major uh, pro to, to, to our field. It's, it's something that, that we need. Um, and, and I've myself started recently um, looking into uncertainty quantification and trying to visualize the results of our, um, of our UQ. And it is also quite a challenge to, because um, we have the 3D data and then adding the uncertainty on top of that, visualizing it in the 3D space is um, definitely a bit of a challenge. Yeah, that's a great point. A lot of the problems we run into in volumetric visualizations, we also run into in the visualization of the uncertainty itself. Yeah, no, that's a, it's a very, very good point. Um, 
uh, there's uh, great questions. Uh, so some of the people on Discord want to know, uh, how can we make our visualiza visualization tools more visible to people outside of our direct collaborations uh, the, to domain scientists, I suppose? Um, and um, and also people want to know what, what what tools we typically use and how we found them, uh, presumably to uh, so that they can get uh, tools in front of us more often. Uh, be curious to hear what everyone has to say on that. I guess let's start with Rob. Yeah. 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 The, the, um, the, the, I guess that, you know, the magic to getting your tools known is, is, is not really magic. I mean, it's getting high profile um, spokespeople almost get representative out of a domain community to use your tools and to show them advantageously in that community so that then it becomes, if not a standard, at least a very attractive, uh, you know, step for labs, clinical setter, set, settings that want to be at the cutting edge. So, so finding good collaborations and, and, and partners with whom you can communicate is the foundation of all this. It, it really has to be there from the start. And if it goes well, and you can add value to that clinical practice or that research uh, impact, then, then the tools will be carried along with the success of that clinical or research uh, progress. And so that becomes, uh, I think, a really key part of it. Um, uh, from, you know, as, as somebody who sits kind of between all these worlds, um, you know, both living in a very um, vibrant visualization environment at the Ski Institute, and yet also being a domain scientist interested in, in cardiac research, um, over the years, of course, we've developed our own tools and, and found that was what we had to do um, for many years. Uh, fortunately, there, there certainly are a few emerging, I would say, systems, um, kind of basic libraries, the whole kitware selection uh, of tools gives people a very flexible and relatively accessible um, set of tools to work with. But there's a, there's a huge challenge in integrating these and putting them all in, in, into place um, with a with a particular application in mind, and it's very um, naive to think that general purpose tools are are going to be what you need for your application, and and so we really need tools that have a great deal more flexibility um, than than many commercial tools really come out of the box with. So so those examples I showed you from a company like Medtronic, for example, and other vendors like that, those are all customized. Those are all made very specifically for a specific application using specific inputs um, with a specific clinical goal in mind and and I, and I think you know we you know the visualization support that that we find most useful is you know are those tools that we can adapt most easily that are that are that are um, open in in a way that that really allows us to manipulate them and reconfigure them for our particular needs and so that that flexibility is driven on the one hand a lot of the software development in the ski institute so that software packages like ski run which you've seen used in a, in a lot of these visualizations today um, that, that's a that's a remarkably um, flexible environment it's not an easy environment to 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 learn and so um, you almost need a different type of tool or different um, structure stratification of tool organization when you're in the early stages of exploring the nature of visualization and where it could fit into workflow and then a whole different tool that is more specialized more streamlined uh, more customized to an application domain when it reaches a level of maturity that 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 it, it you know is useful to do that and so um so, so dumping a piece of software on the open source market and expecting it to be um, recognized for its value and, 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 and taken up by application scientists is just ridiculously naive in my experience. Um, it has to be a much more active um, engagement with the domain world and domain community um, to, to really have the impact that, that many of these developments and, and tools actually deserve. It's fundamentally, it's a motivation why Chris and I felt the Ski Institute had a place in the world. Uh, it was was trying to re rescue some of these algorithms and approaches and put them into tools that at least could be available to engineers and then in some cases, uh, even application scientists directly. Yeah, yeah. so I think, I think that's an interesting point too. And I think it, I was thinking about this before the talk started as well. It's, it's a fine line between having a tool that's generalized enough to kind of reach a broad audience and make it worthwhile to, to generate. And then having that extra flexibility that somebody else can come in and fine tune it to fit their specific purpose. And I think that's what a lot of the tools at the Ski Institute have really helped with. And 
I was trying to explore that and just try to find some type of journalized tools that I can then sit down and then refine for myself for these very specific, you know, application uh, visualizations that I really need just focused on the DBS field. And then also to pick back on a more general uh, concept here, which is I think that this is what I was hoping one of this application spotlight would do in general, which is we're having, you know, engineers come into the Viz conference and then say, hey, here's what we're trying to do. And I'm hoping one of my goals was that some Viz experts go, okay, we, we kind of have a solution for that problem or not. And I've also seen it on the other end. So I think more of this should happen, which is that some Viz experts come to these medical focused conferences and, and present some, some of their own findings. And I think this, this crosstalk should probably be happening even more, but it's a good effort so far to have us come into the Viz talk and then to have Viz experts come into our own uh, specialized conferences as well. And I think that's definitely now opening up a lot of conversations. Mm -hmm. Very good point, Andrew. Uh, Sumitra? Um, I, I don't have much to add to that. Um, I, I would say exactly what Andrew said, having what we are doing here, go the other way around, having people come to our conferences. Um, I definitely see talks in, in, um, in, in, in conferences in my field that are just people presenting software. Um, and that, that's definitely welcomed. So I, I think it's, if someone would try to like, get into such a conference, you would definitely uh, be successful, I think. And another option is, is to have like a booth at a conference, uh, for example, like SFN or HBM, these kind of neuroscience conferences, they have booth, whereas a, um, like a, a company would also, a, you know, just researchers can present their um, stuff, <laughs> basically. That's not, you know, just a scientific talk, but it's really trying to excel something to people. Yeah, uh, yeah, no, I think that's a, a really good point. Um, a, another question, perhaps a, a, a relatively quick one. Um, so um, starting with you, Sumitra, uh, you know, how much machine learning uh, do you, is going to play in this visualization or at least interpretation uh, of at least neural data? Uh, well, don't need to necessarily comment on cardiac data, but I'm curious to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I have nothing to say in cardiac data. <laughs> um, yeah, I would say for visualization. Um, so I saw this question come up before and, and I was thinking about it uh, during the talks. And for visualization, I, I don't really see that, honestly. I, I can't really think of ways. But for interpreting data, yeah, so we do use machine learning. Even just for the modeling, there's currently people um, trying to use machine learning to go directly from an MRI to an electric field with skipping the simulations, which is pretty new. So we have to see where that goes, but there, there are definitely interesting ideas and, and things that we will use. But yeah, visualization wise, I, I, I can't really think of something. So I'm gonna pass this on to my <laughs> fellow speakers. No worries. If anyone can think of specific examples, yeah, no. No, I, I was trying to think about this as well. I haven't seen any direct visualization of like machine learning. And again, it mostly comes down to either classifications, you know, from the output of machine learning or 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 machine learning has been used as a step, again, like I think Symmetra said, to kind of bypass the simulation, uh, some of the simulation side, but that's kind of always just been a, a middle step, not really an end goal. Yeah, I suppose I, I suppose I've seen it in some instances of this sort of the the shape modeling class of uh, of of research where you know you're you're using some at least the manifold learning type uh, classes of tools to sort of simplify certain distributions of morphological changes. So I, I and in terms of visualizing that you know shape modeling can be rather difficult. So, you know, refining that down, it is an analysis step, not necessarily a visualization step, but it does simplify it, uh, simplify that change so it can be visualized. So I suppose that that is one instance in which, it, uh, you know, that it very aptly that machine learning is being used uh, in our fields. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I, there's, as with all new technologies, there's this 
very typical um, process that, that that we see in the adoption of, of any new technology in the field. There's, you know, the early skepticism leading to this kind of blind trust, eventually to a more balanced perspective. And I think visualization has an incredibly important role in in making the process of machine learning, making the process of, of how that information is actually incorporated into a decision in some way apparent to the practitioner. So, so, so a cardiologist is, is gonna be very skeptical about simply being told, you know, go there and do this based on some magic algorithm that I can't tell you about. <clears throat> and that's, that's a bit of a challenge in machine learning generally, of course, but anything we can do um, to help um, uh, sort of reveal the underlying processes as, as much as we know them in a machine learning <clears throat> context in the form of visualization, I think will will help, um, you know, it's a little bit like, like two doctors talking together. They, they want to understand each other's thought process. They may have different perspectives on a case, but they want to understand how each one is getting to that conclusion. And so I think a physician treating a machine learning algorithm as another colleague will want to know the process, will want to know more than this is what you should do. Don't ask me why, this is what you should do. And so anything we can, we can help the physician with to say, oh, this is, this is you know, how we got to this conclusion is gonna, I think, help it be used in the way I, I think any tool, machine learning or simulation-based tool should really be used because physicians make complex decisions based on multiple inputs. And, and, and the goal is never to take that away from them, but rather to add, you know, other perspectives, other insights, and, and, and give them a richer set of information from which to pull. And, and so, so black box algorithms are something they, um, I think with justification would be skeptical of. And so I think, I think visualization to provide insight into this process is, is, a, is a really good and useful goal. Yeah, no, uh, exactly. Even with interpretation, I think interpretation and using the traditional color uh, sort of visualization tools and schemes that we like to use even for interpretability is a major selling point uh, in the case of machine learning and interpreting, which, yeah, as you mentioned, is a major shortfall uh, currently. Um, so I think that was a, a great uh, Q&A session. Uh, we're getting to the end of, our, but sorry, this is the end of our time now. Uh, please uh, submit any additional questions you have on Discord and we'll try to address those. Of course, any of our speakers can be reached by email uh, and any other uh, uh, sources as well. Uh, so thank you so much for listening to us. It was great to sort of give us, give you our perspective on visualiz visualizing these fields and uh, thank you for listening.